Good evening. In this, the sixth message entitled Blessings from the Boat, I dedicate it to the, to the Spence family in Cork City, to Billy Spence's grandson, Alan, to his granddaughters, Donna, Lisa, and Laura, and their mother, Norma. May the Lord bless you as you listen to this. Amen. We're turning again today to some verses from the parable of the prodigal son, and we're reading from verse 11, and the Lord Jesus is speaking, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the hus that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my, father's have bread, of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no wor worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no worth, more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead, and he is alive again, and he was lost and the sound, and they began to be merry. And so reads the word of the living God. As we continue today with the, our sixth message entitled, Blessings from the Boat, we are once again looking at what it means to be honestly and truly and genuinely converted to Christ. Repentance and the sister word conversion, which means to forsake and do an about turn and flee from one's sin, has been replaced with unbiblical words, words such as commitment, words such as decision, and resolution. The Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist and Paul and Peter and the Apostles and Moody and Spurgeon and Wesley and Whitfield and the Puritans and the Reformers and thousands and thousands of more went forth preaching the double cure, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are both inextricably linked. Many so-called Christians in Northern Ireland who are classed as backsliders are not backsliders at all. Many of them never front slid to start with. And I'm saying that, that of course you can backslide and there are many who do backslide and fall away from faith, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. Sadly, many as children and teenagers and even adults pray what they call the sinner's prayer without understanding what the gospel means, without understanding or knowing anything about conviction or contrition or repentance. No cross, no gospel, no blood, no word, no faith. Like the parable of the sower, the seed falls by the wayside and immediately it starts away. Leonard Ravenhill in the 1970s made a staggering statement 
an awesome statement. And here's what he said. He says the sinner's prayer has damned more souls than all the dens of iniquity and all the hell holes and all the brothels and all the evil places of America. What an awesome statement. If that is the case, my friend, God help us. And God help us as parents and children workers and ministers and pastors not to lead our children or anybody else into a false profession and pick unripe fruit and damn another generation. Now, having said that also, I know of a number of people who were saved as children. I know a man who came here to preach, Dr. Danson Smith, was saved at four. I know that other, in, in olden times, a number of them were saved at five and six. I buried a man here at 107 years of age, and he was 100 years saved. He was saved when he was seven. But all those men, if you read about them, and women too, the Holy Spirit was working in their lives, and it was they, as children, went seeking help, not someone trying to pray a prayer with them. So how sad that is. Now, from this portion of Scripture, the parable of the prodigal son, which is probably the greatest of all texts on, on genuine repentance and conversion in the Bible. I finished my message last week, uh, and I, I did so primarily uh, with this portion of Scripture because it models and reflects my own conversion in month of May 1970. My testimony, entitled The Modern Prodigal and Pat's Testimony, has circulated the globe for the last 50 years and has still been printed. <clears throat> what I say tonight is not what, our la what the law of our land says about evidence, talks about circumstantial evidence, talks about hearsay evidence. What I'm talking to tonight is about primary evidence, factual evidence, first-hand evidence, real evidence. <coughs> Excuse me. I can only speak for myself. Every person has their own testimony. And I can speak only for myself and how the Lord dealt with me and how I came to know the Lord as my Savior. And like John in the epistle, which we will turn to in a minute, in John 1, uh, as we come to an end, uh, 1 John chapter 1, uh, John says, the things that we have seen and heard. I'm talking about things that I have seen and I am heard. I'm not talking about somebody else. I am as well placed and qualified to speak on the prodigal son as anybody. I have been to the far country. I have been down to the swine trough. I have been to the husks. I have been in the rags. And I have been there and I know what it is to be regenerated and to be saved and to be cleansed and to be turned around. And I have proved it for over 50, for 53 years and more. Without repeating much of what I said last week, let me just say this. I want to bring this point home because it's very important in these days in which we live of frivolous conversions. In January 1968, when I came home to my mother's house on the shores of Loch Erin, after spending 13 months in the pubs and the clubs and the hell holes of Manchester and sometimes on the streets, I came home clouted in rags, my shoes leaking water, depressed and defeated and destitute. And if it was not for my old broken-hearted white-haired mother, I probably wouldn't have survived. If someone had come to me in the streets of Manchester, or when I stood that January cold winter's day in 1968 on the banks of the air and said to me, would you like to go to heaven? Would you like to, uh, to, 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 to know the Lord? Would you, would you like to be saved? Would you pray this wee prayer? I'd have probably prayed it. But would I have been saved? No. No. No, because I hadn't been to the swine truck yet. I hadn't been down far enough the road to the husks yet. 
That had to happen before I came to, to myself and realized that I must come to Christ. That's my testimony. Do you think that I would have been saved if I had just prayed a wee prayer? It was two years and five months after that when I repented of my sin and came to Christ. I went back to England and I came back the second time worse than the first time. Full of drunk drink one night, I hit an ass of oil tanker and ended up in the Shale Hospital in Ballyshannon, cut and bleeded, nursed by, nursed by the nuns. Do you think if someone had come into my bedside that day and said, do you want to say the sinner's prayer? I'd have said anything. But would I have been saved? No. The guards lifted me another night and gave me a, 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 a scalping and put me into the cell and let me out at five o'clock in the morning. Do you think if I'd have somebody had come to me as I walked up that street of Bundoran that night and said, do you, do, you want a, do you want a better life than this? Of course I wanted a better life than this. Will you pray the sinner's prayer? Would I have been saved? No, a thousand times no. I'm not mentioning these things tonight to draw attention to myself and those things I seldom ever mention in my testament. I'm not mentioning them to give glory to the devil. But what I am doing is painting a picture to you of a dead, dark, doomed sinner, depraved, uh, evil, and wicked in many ways. Let me tell you, I'm telling you that the heart is deceitful. The heart lies to you. It is deceitful and above all things. Above all things, it's not only wicked, but above all things, desperately wicked. A few words made up of a man and repeated over, my friend, was not, it would not be enough to remove the inherent sin that I was born in or you were born or in or anybody else was born in. It has to be a deeper work than that. Let me make this perfectly clear, those of you who have heard my testimony and have read it. That Sunday night in May 1970, when Pat and I went down to Bundoran to the drinking and to the dancing, well, when we ended up in the IAB convention in the middle of the street in the Methodist Church, I hadn't one thought of God that night. God never spoke to me in that meeting that night. He spoke to Pat and she next, next message will be telling you how that happened. But I came back that night and brought Pat home to Enniskillen and went back to my mother's house. And about 12 o'clock at night in my mother's house, the Holy Spirit began to deal in my life. God began to work in my life. I began to think of so many things. I couldn't sleep. I, I walked the floor of that house. I thought of the farm of land that was around me that my father squandered. I thought of my past. I often say and think to myself, there was three bees. There was the Beatles, and mind you, it wasn't the Beatles that were on top of the charts. It was the Beatle Volkswagen. Did you ever hear the Beatle Volkswagen? Well, between our house and the loch, there was a sharp corner, the main road to Donegal. You know, I thought every man in Donegal had a beetle because the, the engine was in the back of them. When they came up to the corner, they changed them down and they wear those jars. Kept me awake often. And then there was the birds. Down on the shore in the bay and in, in the moonlight nights, the ducks used to you know, create an awful noise. Many the night they kept me awake. You'd have to be half drunk to sleep. And then there was the battle. My friend, a battle raged in my life that night that went on for hours. My past came up before me, the things that I had done and where I was, and had no friends, no home, and no job. I tell you, my friend, I began to, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And then I rang in the early hours of the morning, that uncle of mine, Billy Spence, I have never, never knew a godly man as him. I can say that honestly. And I rang that man because I knew there was something different in him. Many the time he testified to me and my father, many the warning he gave us. But I laughed at him and I mocked him. But that early morning and Monday morning, I, I lifted the phone and I got his number. He only lived a few miles away. I never was at his house. And so I rang him. And he said, I'll come down to see you. And he came down to see me the next morning. 
and he brought me up to his farmhouse. I can tell you, my friend, I was subdued. I was very subdued that Monday morning as I sat in that farmhouse with that old Wesleyan um, lay preacher, and that's what he was. And he opened the Bible at 1 John chapter 1, and here's the verses that he began to read to me. He read, uh, I didn't know where he was reading from. I never read the Bible. But I was sitting there like a mouse, and this old farmer opened the Bible at 1 John 1, and he read this. This then is the message which we have heard of him. Uh, John was talking about Jesus, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, I didn't know, and I don't know whether he explained this or not, but you see that phrase there, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Do you know that light was the first thing that God created? And whenever God created, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were all involved in the creation. They were all involved because of the darkness. It says the darkness covered the face of the deep, and God says, let there be light, and there was light. I want to say to you just now very clearly, as I come to the close of this message, a dark and doomed and depraved sinner needs the light of the glorious gospel of Christ to shine into their heart before they can be saved. And the whole trinity is involved in the man's salvation, not a wee prayer. The father thought it, the son wrought it, the spirit brought it, and, and we pass from death unto life. Uh, death unto life and out of darkness into the marvelous light of the glorious gospel and we're new creations and we're transformed and we're changed. Glory to God. That is the gospel message. And then this man read on. He read on in verse 5. Verse 6, he says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And here's the verse. And here's the verse that I, Bertie Johnson, was saved through in the last day of May, 1970. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. My friend, do you see what this man was doing? Do you see what the Holy Spirit was doing? What were they doing? They were showing me about sin. You see, I was a sinner. That was my problem. And I remember Billy saying to me, Bertie, he says, your trouble's not drink. And the bad language, and I had an awful foul tongue. He says, your trouble's not drink, and it's not bad language, and it's not smoking, and I was a chain smoker almost. None of those things is your problem. Your problem is sin. And this man painted for me a picture of a sinner that I was a sinner, and that was the root, and the root, he said to me, Bertie, the root has to be dealt with to deal with the fruit. And then he went on from there to talk about the cross. He went on there to tell me about the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanseth from all sin. And then he went on after that, and he told me if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He didn't pray a wee prayer with me. You know what he did? He turned round on his knees. I can see him yet. He had a pair of Wellington boots on him. He turned round on his knees and he got down to the chair and he says, Oh God, deliver Bertie. I didn't pray a wee prayer. This man had brought me to the cross. He had brought me to Christ. He had shown me a sin. He had given me the gospel. And I walked out onto the street that morning after 11 o'clock. Now, I didn't know what to say, and I didn't know what to do, but I said, Lord, if what this man's saying's right, if what this man's saying true, then will you do something with this life of mine? And thank God that moment, my friend, I passed from death unto life. Thank God I can testify to 54 years coming up now in May that Jesus saves and Jesus keeps and Jesus blesses. And not only that, he saved my wife Pat that night and the next day, we both came together to that home, and she will tell you about that in the next message next week. Good evening, and God bless you, and thank you for listening. Amen.